Hello, and welcome to Environment Matters, a monthly podcast by the Environment Team at Burgess Salmon. I'm Mike Barlow, and I'm the head of the Environment Team. Each month, I will be joined by experts from across Burgess Salmon to discuss the most pressing environmental developments and hot topics in UK law. Today, I'm joined by Ian Truman, Sarah Sackville-Hamilton and Victoria Barnes, who all work with me in the Environment Team. Hi all, and Happy New Year. Hi Mike, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, Bearing in mind the time of year, we thought we would tackle this podcast a little bit differently to how we have in the past. Uh, Our past podcasts have been focusing on one particular area and doing a a deep dive into it. Um, And we had planned to do an episode on uh, with an ESG focus. But but bearing in mind the time of year, what we thought we would do is have a look back at uh, environmental developments in 2023. uh, Look at how our predictions for that year panned out. And then have a look forward to what we might expect uh, on an environmental basis in 2024. So my, my personal reflection uh, on 2023 is that really it was a year of um, policy delays and parliamentary retreats. Uh, and looking back at our article about what we thought we'd expect in 2023, it's interesting to see how many of those things have not come forward but are still in the pipeline and we may touch on some of those later and when we look at um, what might happen in 2024. But just an example of of this um, in my particular uh, area of work was some work I was doing for an international client in relation to energy audits due under the Energy Efficiency Directive, which in the UK uh, comes under uh, what we call ESOS, uh, Energy Savings and Opportunities Scheme. And I was helping a client with compliance across a number of jurisdictions in the EU. And all of those uh, time limits all remained the same. Um, But in the UK, whereas our deadline was December 2023 to get those audits done, those have been delayed to June 2024. And of course, that is something that we can do now uh, post Brexit. Um, we can we can set our own deadlines, even though the underlying obligation came from from uh, an old piece of e- EU law. So I think that's just a good example, really, of when uh, of what I've described as a as a policy delay has had a, a, a knock on effect and, and it has really sort of given us a different position to um, to those across across the EU. So, Victoria, what, what do you want to just talk us through? Any reflections from 2023? Uh, any highlights, lowlights? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think um, your sort of tagline of the policy delay parliamentary retreat sort of uh, pretty much captures my feeling on it and kind of two pivotal sort of moments for me on sort of the parliamentary retreat side of things was um, firstly the retained EU law bill, which has now become an act. And the other one um, relates to nutrient neutrality requirements, um, which which played out in the levelling up legislation, um, the latter part of, of last year. But firstly, to, um, to retain EU law, we obviously flag that as a battleground in our in our article at the start of last year. And of course, much of last year was focused on what was going to happen with retained EU law and the rule bill, um, as it was um, referred to. And the, the main focus was on the sunsetting provision, which essentially would have seen every retained EU law that had not been picked to be kept or amended, uh, repealed on the 31st of December, the bulk of which were environmental laws. Um, I, I think ESOS being an example of one of yeah, those that I yeah. touched on already. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, parliamentarians and, and other commentators sort of describe this sunset provision as a cliff edge, um, which really would have seen swathes of potentially vital environmental laws sort of falling away. So the go- government ultimately climbed down, embarrassingly for them, because obviously they had held that up as kind of, you know, unshackling themselves from EU law. But they did climb down from their initial plan. And, and really, that was in light of widespread concern that they were just we were just going to lose rafts of of retained EU laws, which affect everyday life. And no one really knew quite what the complete picture was. And we ne- there was never a definitive list of, of what would be lost. And it was ultimately too big a regulatory risk, really. So they did do an almighty 180 on it. But we did. The, the rule bill became an act and that passed in June. And that did outline um, 600 laws, which were 
repealed on the 31st of December. So obviously a significant retreat of what we could have seen. Um, but there was still some, um, for some, what some comments have said, some, some key provisions still were repealed. So some dealing with parts of EU air quality regulations, um, regulation requiring environmental impact assessments. We carried out on water abstraction, for example. But but ultimately, we didn't have the cliff edge as um, as could have happened last year. And then and then the other kind of big U turn, um, which was was important, was on on nutrient neutrality, neutrality. And there was the sort of run long running parliamentary saga involving the levelling up and regeneration bill, which has now become an act. Um, which officially became law um, in October. Um, now, what the government had attempted to do as that that bill made its way through Parliament was to um, include an amendment which would have scrapped the nutrient neutrality requirement, namely by requiring local planning authorities to assume that wastewater from developments would not adversely affect the habitat site and therefore removing the need for nutrient neutrality to be demonstrated. Um, maybe just a quick recap, if maybe for our listeners' benefit, of what we mean by nutrient neutrality. The sort of these requirements sort of flow from a, a 2019 EU ruling. Um, basically, the principles require that new housing developments in certain areas um, should not add more nutrient pollution to the water catchment, and where that can't be shown, or where damage to the protected water force cannot be ruled out then mitigation to eliminate the impact is required before planning permission can be granted. And these requirements are alleged to have significantly stalled development of new houses in certain in certain areas. So what the government tried to do was they were trying to obviously unblock these issues around development. So they included this amendment in the levelling up bill, but it was ultimately defeated by the Lords um, to, to much relief for many environmentalists. Now, it seems that the requirement to provide nutrient neutrality um, or nutrient mitigation um, will remain for, for some time. We're, we're not foreseeing a new bill dealing with it, particularly for the, the what remains of this um, parliament and, and the expectation that we may see a general election. Um, but the levelling up Act did include some provisions which um, may mitigate some of the issues that developers have seen. But but ultimately, yeah, as as said at the start, a, a, another significant retreat by the government. That's great, thank you. And and as you say, hot off the press, um, as we're recording this on the fourth of January, for those six hundred pieces of legislation being repealed. And and uh, I always thought that that nutrient neutrality piece of legislation was was a terrible uh, way to try and address the problem. So uh, I, I wasn't disappointed when that got defeated. Ian, what are, have you got any reflections from 2023? Yes, Mike. I, when I look back at where we were this time last year and, and looking ahead at 2023, one thing that I don't think any of us foresaw was the changes, the further changes we've seen in 2023 to variable monetary penalties. This time last year, we were um, fair, we were getting comfortable, or I wouldn't say comfortable, we were getting used to the fact that, that um, in October 2022, the cap for variable mon monetary penalties had been increased significantly from £250,000 to £250 million. And I think anyone thought that we'd see further changes um, at, in 2023. Um, but of course, uh, over the summer um, and autumn, we saw consultation from the um, from the Environment Agency around both extending the scope of variable monetary penalties, but also removing this cap on variable monetary penalties completely for certain offences, to leave us with a situation where there are potentially unlimited variable monetary penalties applicable um, to certain offences under the environmental permitting regulations, for example where previously only an enforcement undertaking was available. Um, so this this has obviously all been driven by the focus that we've seen over the last year on um, water pollution. And it's really an example of where politics um, in some respects has delayed certain aspects of, of, of environmental law developments, but, but really accelerated or driven um, certain changes that, that really weren't, um, weren't on the agenda necessarily 
um, this time last year. So um, that that's my that's sort of my highlight reflection from where we were this time last year. And I'll stop there because I'm cheating a little bit. And it's probably going to be my thing to watch for 2024 as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that that was a big development, um, and I certainly hadn't seen it coming. I think the uh, you know I've, I've been in the press as saying that the extension to all in, uh, environmental permitting offences is is a sort of natural extension, but I hadn't really seen the extension to the um, or the the lifting of the of the limit on the on the variable monetary penalties coming forward in in the way that it did. So I think that is a big development and, um, and look forward to hearing your your thoughts on that for 2024. Sarah, what was your highlight of 2023 or or low light? I'm going to pick out biodiversity net gain or more specifically and, and continuing on our theme of policy delays, the, the delay to the much anticipated uh, introduction of the mandatory biodiversity net gain requirements. These were brought in originally through the Environment Act in 2021, and the expectation had been that the mandatory biodiversity net gain requirement was going to go live in November 2023. So what that requirement would mean was that most new developments would need to deliver at least a 10% net gain in biodiversity as a condition to securing their their planning permission. There would be some exceptions to that, some later dates, but the, the headline was that most new development was going to need to demonstrate 10% BNG from November 2023. This ended up being delayed reasonably last minute to January 2024. So as of today, it is now live. Um, the delay wasn't hugely surprising in the end, given how much was still outstanding in the way of detail on how the BNG requirements were going to work in practice. Although the, the key features of the regime were clear from the Environment Act and the metrics and guidance published by DEFRA to date put a lot of flesh on that. There remained quite a lot of concerns around the detail of how the requirements were going to operate in practice. Pushing things back by a few months allowed the government time to publish those extra bits of regulation and guidance. And there was a big batch of that that came out at the end of last year. So for anyone who's looking at BNG obligations or opportunities, those I think it's six sets of regulations and some accompanying guidance I'd, I'd really recommend for getting your head round. I think BNG is going to continue to be a, a hot topic of 2024. It's now live. It's a, a first sort of compliance market for natural capital in in the nature space so is a really big thing and i think for developers who are working to meet the new requirements or for landowners and ecosystem service providers who are working on bng habitat creation projects and also for local planning authorities and the new responsible bodies who are going to be overseeing and enforcing compliance with bng obligations 2024 is going to be a steep learning curve as everyone needs to get their head around how this is going to work. And I think it's also going to be interesting to see the wider impact that this new compliance market has on sort of environmental credits markets more generally and, and natural capital. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think um, uh, it's another another great theme and something which is going to be really interesting to watch through 2024 to see what that does to those to those markets and and, and how they develop. Right, so turning to our predictions for 2024. Um, so as we, I've mentioned earlier, we always produce an article on what we expect to happen in the following year in uh, environmental law field. Uh, we've This year has been no different and we've published our 2024 article. Um, and what we thought we would do is just pick out a couple of topics um, from that and for the, for the next year and go into a little bit more detail in relation to those. So. Sarah, um, over to you to sort of pick out the first one. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. The topic that I have picked out is UK CBAM, and that stands for the UK Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. The government announced at the or towards the end of December 2023 that it plans to introduce a UK CBAM by 2027 and that it's going to be consulting on the detail of its design and delivery during 2024. The purpose of a UK CBAM is going to be to mitigate carbon leakage by imposing a charge on the carbon emissions that are embodied in imports. 
it, it'll, it's proposed to be similar to the CBAM that was introduced by the EU last year. And it'll, if it is introduced as proposed, it'll make the UK the second jurisdiction after the EU to implement that type of carbon border adjustment mechanism to combat carbon leakage. And what do we mean by carbon leakage? It, it's the movement of production and associated emissions of products from one country to another as a result of different levels of decarbonisation efforts through carbon pricing and climate regulation. So looking at the UK specifically, our net zero targets mean that the government's introduced a range of different policies and regulations to drive industrial carb decarbonisation. A good example is the carbon pricing that's imposed on many industrial and manufacturing processes through the UK emissions trading scheme. Because not all countries are advancing in their decarbonisation efforts as quickly as we are in the UK, there's a risk that production of goods will be moved from the UK to another country that isn't subject to the same level of carbon pricing or other climate regulation, and therefore products can be produced more cheaply in that other country. And that movement is what's known as carbon leakage. What the government did last year was to consult on a range of possible policy measures to mitigate the risk of carbon leakage. And that consultation ran between March and June. A UK CBAM was one of the measures that they considered. And the December announcement confirms that the measure is going to be taken forward for implementation by 2027. What we know standing here at the start of 2024 about the proposed UK CBAM is that it will place a carbon price on what are considered to be some of the most emission intensive industrial goods imported to the UK. Based on what the government has said so far, those are expected at the moment to be iron and steel, aluminium, cement, fertiliser, hydrogen, ceramics and glass. But the final list of the sectors that are going to be within the scope of CBAM is yet to be confirmed. And from what we've seen in the EU, if the UK goes down the same route, that might remain a fluid list going forward and subject to change. It's also worth noting that the list that the UK government has sort of trailed at the moment is a slightly different list of sectors to the EU CBAM. Another thing that we do know at the moment is that CBAM liability will be imposed on the importer of the goods and that liability will be calculated on the basis of the amount of emissions that are embodied in the imported goods multiplied by the UK's effective carbon price, then with a deduction for any carbon price that's applied to the goods in the country where they were produced. The overall objective for UK CBAM and so how that calculation will work is to make sure that importers of goods from in-scope sectors have to pay a comparable price to equivalent goods that are produced in the UK. So that's what we do know. There's an awful lot that we don't know yet about how UK CBAM will operate if it does come in. For example, it hasn't yet been confirmed whether it would have a phased introduction, like the equivalent mechanism which the EU introduced last year. So EU CBAM came in from the 1st of October 2023, but only the reporting obligations under that regime apply at first. And the financial implications, so the obligations that will actually impose a carbon price, won't come in until 2026. We also don't know, quite crucially, what methodologies are actually going to be used to calculate the emissions of goods within the scope of CBAM. Those are the types of details that we're expecting the government to consult on during 2024. And it's going to be really important for businesses who could be affected by UK CBAM to track the development of this policy measure really closely. And in particular, to consider responding to the consultations to help shape the detail of the mechanism. I think that'll be particularly important for UK importers of relevant goods and also for those who are further down the supply chain who will be feeling the financial effects of a new carbon price. So hopefully that's a helpful snapshot of what to look out for on UK CBAM this year. Thanks, Sarah. That's that's a really useful summary. I mean, a couple of key points I take away from that. One is uh, UK CBAM is not the same as EU CBAM, so it's really important to follow the detail of this one. And then I suppose the second point is it is ongoing and developing, and so it is really important to track those developments and to get involved. And also, I suppose, a point that I could have made at the outset of this is, that of course, we're potentially in an election year, and there is a question of how all of that survives a potential change uh, in in government if we're looking at 2027 for the final introduction of it. So um, uh, I think that's a really 
interesting area to to be to be watching. Yeah, and just to pick up on that final point you made, I think that is a theme that probably runs through everything we're saying, that point around the election. We're either going to be seeing various election winning announcements coming out, or we're going to be seeing the can being kicked down the road till post-election on on various things or, or a combination of the two. So I think it is going to be quite a, a fluid year potentially and, and all the more important to keep an eye on what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. So Ian, I think you've you've sort of partially trailed what you're going to be picking out for 2024. But uh, do you want to give us a little bit more detail? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, I mean, just just to sort of um, go back to December last year. So really not very not very long ago. So this is really hot off the press. On the first of December last year, um, two sets of regulations or two instruments were um, came into force. One was the latest set of amendment regulations um, changing the environmental permitting regulations in England and Wales. And what those did was that they introduced a new Schedule 26A, which um, introduced variable monetary penalties um, for offences under the uh, environmental permitting regulations. Now, the offences themselves are listed in Regulation 38, and there's sort of five separate sections within that. Um, the, the most common offences sort of around um, operating without a permit and breaching permit conditions um, are all subject to potentially un, unlimited variable monetary penalties now. Um, I will explain why in the next in the next instrument we go to. Um, but there are certain offences like failing to provide um, information or falsifying information, which do remain limited to um, the amount of the fine that would be applicable in criminal proceedings. So, so that's the change to the environmental permitting regulations. And of course, before that, um, it was only uh, the only civil sanctions available for offences under the permitting regulations was an enforcement undertaking. Um, so obviously, um, Quite, quite a change there, and and I think the reason for this is still can still be traced back to that government drive to appear to be doing more to um, punish um, those that were polluting um, watercourses, particularly. I mean, and there's a lot been in the press about that, but these changes really do go a lot further because, of course, the environmental permitting regulations cover an awful lot more than that. So we're also looking at waste offences. Um, manufacturing businesses um, with uh, emissions to air and um, all of those sorts of processes as well. So the second order I mentioned um, was the Environmental Civil Sanctions uh, Amendment Order of 2023. And what this did was that it changed um, the original uh, Environmental Civil Sanctions Order of 2010 by removing the section in Schedule 2, which imposed a limit on variable monetary penalties of £250,000. I mentioned in the introduction there was also a consultation by the Environment Agency to extend this cap to £250 million. And whilst that was consulted on, um, it was never actually implemented. And, and now what we've seen is that they've gone from, um, we've gone from a position where there was a consultation on increasing it tenfold to it being removed entirely. So what we've got, had since the 1st of December last year is a situation where variable monetary penalties have no cap. The Environment Agency has made it clear that it wants to fill what it's described as an enforcement gap between civil sanctions and cr criminal um, prosecutions. It has said, however, that when it's administering var variable monetary penalties, that are uncapped. It will be determining those amounts in the same way as it does for criminal fines for environmental offences. So we're, we're familiar with um, the environmental um, sentencing guidelines for offences. So what we've got there is a fine that will uh, essentially be proportionate to the size of the company and will account for the level of culpability, a category of the harm caused, if, if you remember, our listeners remember, there were four categories uh, of harm caused from one to four, and there are various um, levels of culpability. And you then get a starting point um, and a range uh, of possible fine, and then you apply um, aggravating or mitigating factors. Now, of course, 
that suggests that there is a starting point for, for these fines, even though they're unlimited. But for very large organisations, there is certainly scope for um, these, these fines to be much more significant. And, and the sentencing guidelines actually say specifically that it may be necessary to move outside the ranges suggested in that document to achieve a proportionate sentence. Now, this all sounds good from the Environment Agency's perspective um, in, in terms of their ability to levy more significant fines. Um, and it also seems quite reasonable at first glance to apply the same process uh, as you would in, in criminal proceedings. But there are, of course, significant differences between how a variable monetary penalty is administered and the sort of much more rigorous process around a criminal prosecution and particularly things like you know, requirements for disclosure, for example, that you'd get um, in the event of a, a, criminal, um, a, a criminal investigation, which won't necessarily be available to, um, to a recipient of a variable monetary penalty. There will, of course, be appeals um, and a, a right to appeal. And the, the regulations say that um, if you do appeal a variable monetary penalty, it obviously won't apply until that appeal has been determined. But it remains to be seen, and, and what we need to look out for in 2024 is really how these um, variable monetary penalties are administered and de determined where you have a, a particularly a large, a very large organisation um, and what the process will be and how it will operate in practice out where you've got this process outside the established um, uh, criminal prosecutions um, procedure. Yeah, no, uh, that's that's really helpful, Ian. And I think we all wait with sort of bated breath for the first of these VMPs to to land and to see what what happens. And I, th I think one of the key things is the is the process that's going to take place, and 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 organisations need to be ready for that um, in case they want to appeal, because there's a much more truncated process to to what we're used to in terms of um, environmental enforcement. So thank you for that. Um, Victoria, do you want to, uh, I think you were going to talk about climate litigation and, and greenwashing um, and what to expect in 2024. Should we should we turn to that now? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's right. I was, um, I was going to pick up on that and um, it's not so much a new hot topic, but I think 2024 we'll see sort of our attention remaining focused on climate change litigation, which has obviously gathered pace over a number of years, um, and relatedly sort of climate washing and greenwashing actions. So I guess just a quick reflection on 2023, that sort of continued to be a busy year for climate change related litigation sort of globally, um, and including in the UK. And one particular case, you know, I'll mention um, as we sort of we've sort of followed it um, for a number of articles last year, and that was the derivative claim that Client Earth, um, a um, NGO, um, brought against Shell's directors, and that sort of played out before the High Court and the Court of Appeal throughout last year. Now, Client Earth alleged in that claim that. Um, that Shell's board had mismanaged climate risk um, and that had put the directors in breach of their duties under the UK's Companies Act. Now, the, although the sort of High Court dismissed client earth application and the Court of Appeal refused permission to appeal, the case did stir up a lot of interest in boardrooms and, and it may continue to play on directors and officers' minds up going forward. Um, so, yeah, so 2023 is still busy on climate litigation. And I think, you know, 2024 um, will continue on that trend. Certainly all eyes are going to be on the Supreme Court, which is currently considering the case of Finch. Um, and a decision is expected in this sort of the first half of this year. Now, the key question in the in the Finch case um, so this is a this is a judicial review brought by the um, Wheeled Action Group against Surrey County Council. Um, the key question, Finch, is whether a planning authority that's considering a project of crude oil extraction should have 
um, should have a requirement to assess the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the eventual use of the refined products of that oil um, as fuel. Now, the High Court concluded that these emissions were incapable of falling within the scope of an assessment. However, the Court of Appeal, although reaching the same eventual outcome in that particular case, did not draw such a firm line, um, holding that scope three emissions were capable of being direct and indirect significant effects of a proposed development. So, um, although this judgment appears to have opened the door to requiring the assessment of scope three emissions, there was a great deal left unresolved by the Court of Appeal, which both developers and decision makers will hope the Supreme Court takes the opportunity to to clarify. So that has um, that will have implications going forward for other proposed developments. So um, lots of focus have been on Finch, and of course the Office of Environmental Protection intervened in that case as well, made submissions. So it has stirred up a lot of interest last year, and as I say, all eyes will be on the Supreme Court for a for a clarification on the position um, uh, this year. Um, there are also a number of other judicial reviews pending against the government. This year, um, there's a challenge to the UK government's March 2023 um, carbon budget delivery plan um, that's brought by Friends of the Earth, um, Good Law Project and Client Earth. This is essentially a sequel to the challenge to the net zero strategy in 2022. And, and similarly, we've got Chris Packhams, who's a TV presenter and campaigner, his challenge to the government's net zero policy changes, principally the government's decisions to delay a series of green pledges, such as the ban on the sale of new petrol cars and um, oil and gas boilers. Um, so those JRs will, will play out this year. Um, so that's sort of the climate um, litigation side of things. Thanks for that. Have we got any, and it's probably an impossible question, do we have any idea when the Finch judgment might be handed down? I had heard that it was sort of expected around Easter time, but I don't know on what basis someone has, you know, predicted that. But yeah, there's probably, I guess it's more likely not to be the first half of this year. But again, yeah, it's very hard to to know for sure, yeah, when it when it could land. But I sort of I sort of ran to sort of climate litigation side of things, and I mentioned sort of climate washing, greenwashing actions. Of course, we did our recent podcast on on greenwashing, Mike, which our listeners you know can plug into um, to get up to speed on on greenwashing, sort of generally, um, and the risks and, and and the like. And I I think you know we we saw that as a very much a hot topic last year. We're gonna it's going to remain so in 2024. You know, there has been a growth in greenwashing cases. Um, which challenge the accuracy of green claims and commitments. And we expect um, sort of the same level of scrutiny from NGOs, activists and regulators as, we, uh, as we've as we now entered this year. The ASA, so the Advertising Standards Authority, their reach in that sort of endeavour um, has been sort of bolstered and enhanced by their new AI tools, which they're utilising. And these are being used to identify possible greenwashing in adverts. Um, and they're already using that and they're expecting to roll that out further. Um, so that will enable them to to look at look at claims out there and 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 initiate investigations. We also like to see some important regulatory developments on greenwashing um, come into force or at least complete their legislative processes. So there's the Digital Competition and Consumers Bill, um, which has been working its way through through Parliament that um, will shore up the CMA's powers to take enforcement action, action, namely its ability to impose financial penalties up to 10% of global turnover for breaches of consumer law, such as misleading consumers in the in the greenwashing space. There's the FCA's anti-greenwashing rule, which will um, come into force um, uh, the f- sort of first half of this year, and the um, EU's new green claims directive as well um, may complete its um, its list of passage. Um, so lots of developments sort of coming into the mix. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Victoria. And certainly something we're seeing, isn't it, with many clients being concerned about their marketing materials and so on um, and wanting to understand where they 
where they have risks are bearing in mind that developing uh, sort of area of law. So yeah, th th thank no, you for that. that. Exactly. Yeah, you're exactly They're right. Definitely. Clients are concerned about it and, and wanting to make sure they're ahead of it as well. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you for that. And then lastly, I was going to go last and I was just going to pick out a few points relating to products and chemicals, which I won't go through in any detail, but they're, they're all live points. Uh, the first is the, the UK's chemicals strategy, um, which we have been waiting for since 2018, which was in the uh, environment plan then. I think we had it as something that was going to come out in 2023 and was not expected in 2023, but we haven't had it yet. So we are expecting it in 2024. Uh, so that was the first thing. Um, the second thing to pick up in this area is the uh, new extended producer responsibility regime relating to packaging waste, which has have already been delayed in 2023, but has been delayed again uh, now, or parts of it have. Some parts of the of the regime are already live, uh, so the uh, data collection aspects of it are, are live, but the first and second data reports were due to be submitted to the Environment Agency on the 1st of October 2023 and 1st of April 2024 respectively, but the Environment Agency has now confirmed that these can be submitted up until the 31st of May 2024, so another uh, slight delay there. The third area to pick up in this um, uh, particular topic is in relation to CE markings and UK CA markings. So originally 2024 was expected to be the last year in which businesses could place products on the GB market using the um, EU CE product safety mark. Um, and after that, they it was intended they would transfer to using the um, post-Brexit UK CA mark. But the government's now announced that it intends to introduce, introduce legislation uh, to recognise goods that meet EU requirements, uh, such as CE marking indefinitely. So beyond 31st of December 2024 for many products. So that will mean that manufacturers have a choice as to whether to use a CE marking or a UK CA marking. There are some variations between product safety regimes um, and the areas to which that extension applies. So it is important to check what's applicable to certain products. And then lastly, just in relation to UK reach, in November last year, the government published outlawing plans for an alternative transitional registration model for UK reach uh, with an intention to reduce the costs to industry, which from registration, which are, are estimated at around two, two billion pounds. And there's a consultation on the proposals um, expected in early 2024. So that is uh, something to, to watch out for. So uh, that's where we'll wrap up our podcast today. Um, thank you so much for joining me, uh, Victoria, Sarah and Ian. It's been a really interesting discussion with plenty to look out for in 2024. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, a pleasure, Mike. Yep, thanks for having me, Mike. Thank you for listening to Environment Matters. If you'd like to know more about our environment team and how our experts can work with you, you can contact me and the rest of the team via our website. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may also enjoy listening to our previous podcast episodes on greenwashing, natural capital and variable monetary penalties, which are available on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our next episode will cover ESG, how to manage climate change and sustainability in supply chains. So don't forget to subscribe and thanks for listening.